is a little bit of a tour of force, and it's really interesting when you're a professor of public health about the sorts of things you might engage in. Um, and for that reason, I thought I'd make a few disclosures. This was half, half a discussion of you know, what we should and shouldn't do, um, which has been an interesting thing in academia over the COVID thing. You know, should you just be doing science or should you be doing advocacy? What's an epidemiologist? How does that end? Uh, those sorts of things. But just to let you know what I'm doing now, and you can consider those. Um, for the last 10 years, uh, my colleague, Professor Zinn here, who you'll meet in a moment, and I have been writing the What the Fat book series, something we're really proud of, but you know, we really are, have been down that low-carb um, and fasting community for at least that time uh, and probably longer. Um, more recently, 14 of us uh, health professionals and academics started an enterprise called Precure, Prevention is Cure, uh, and I'm the chief scientist for that organisation now. Um, as well as being an academic and uh, what we've been doing there is really thinking about workforce development, especially the role of the health coach, the nutrition health coach, the mental health coach, uh, the role of behaviour change techniques in modern medicine. And I think in New Zealand uh, we've managed to advance that somewhat uh, and I think you in Australia have the same problem that we do, uh, that in 10 to 15 years time half of our general practice workforce will no longer exist because at the moment their average age is 55. Um, they're not necessarily going to die, although some may, uh, but, but they, they will certainly be not working in the way they are now and we won't be able to replace them. So we're going to have to think about a different model. Uh, I really liked the discussion of what they called fast medicine yesterday, in and out medicine, and its likeness to fast food is what I took from that. I'm not sure if that's what you meant. Um, that's what we've been doing there. Um, this is the prevention is pure a podcast. I only mention that because the whole series at the moment is uh, on mental health, and in particular if you've met yesterday Dr Matthew Phillips, there's an hour 45 I think with uh, him on there, and you just get another whole level of the brilliance of that uh, man and his importance in metabolic health in the world. Uh, I'm, I'm also employed by Movember as their chief mental health advisor for New Zealand, so I'm, I'm paid to advocate for mental health, which is a really interesting idea that you would get people who want to do primarily science to also advocate um, that has its issues. We've been funded for our whole career by the Health Research Council of New Zealand, so I shouldn't say too much bad about the government. Um, I, I know there's a law against that, you can do that anyway. So yeah, um, we've got issues there. But at the moment we're doing, a, I guess, what we call implementation research, which is the idea that although we know things work, like carb being an example, how do we get them to actually work in the real world? So our current trial is really around trying to see how uh, low-carb, ketogenic diets, uh, that sort of metabolic approach can work in real-life primary care. Um, and last of all, I'm in this thing called the Hope Challenge, which means I'm going to swim bike and run from uh, the top of the North Island to Parliament, partially in protest um, but mainly to of the government, um, but mainly to advocate for serious changes in our mental health system, um, some of which I'll talk about today. Uh, so let's start with politics and then get into mechanism, science uh, and probable causes. I think this is a really interesting thing to think about, uh, especially when you think about, I want to be concentrating specifically about mental health today. And this, in Australia and New Zealand over the last couple of years, we've been so concerned that we shut down the whole country. Um, Melbourne, I don't know what you're doing there. Uh, <laughs> But, but we were concerned that the health system was going to get overwhelmed and we wanted to avoid that overwhelm at all costs, um, ignoring the fact that it's already overwhelmed with metabolic disease, but the one that really stands out from, from as a parent, uh, as a husband, as a member of society is our mental health crisis, that at any one time of us, one in five will be su suffering serious psychological distress. That has grown in both countries from 5% it doubled over a 10 year period and then the last 10 years it doubled again with good epidemiology from our health surveys to measure that. So this sort of supply of distress, distressed people has just gone up for some reason. And one of three of us will suffer a serious uh, psychiatric issue at some point in our life that will require some form of treatment. Uh, and we have very little in the, in the sort of three areas that you might consider to be important for this. The first that preventing it in the first place, the prevention is cure. There is a science on that, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, isn't really funded in either country. Uh, the treatment gap, so the ability to get services that work uh, and are timely, 
uh, is almost impossible. If you know anyone who's been trying to find a psychologist in the public health or the private system, um, that's problematic. We have about 20% of the workforce that we would need, and we have no way of fulfilling that. And last of all, uh, which is the most perverse in many ways, at the sharp end of, of poor mental health in the event of a crisis, uh, our ability to provide humane community care appears to be absent. And at least in New Zealand, if you ring the crisis line, which I have on friends and family, they go, are they trying to kill themselves right now? You know, well, no, I'd, I'd be not calling you if they were doing that. I'd be attending to that. And then they go, have you asked them how they're feeling? And you go, oh, shit, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> And, and then they go, well, if it gets any worse, call the police. Well, I mean, that's perverse at every level, isn't it? It makes you want to cry. Who wants to call the police? First of all, they're not policing and doing what they're doing, which is stopping crime. They're ill prepared for mental health crises. And who wants to call the police on their cousin, their son, their mother? I mean, that appears to be wrong at every level. So where did we go wrong? in mental health and where have we gone wrong in society. I think Matthew Phillips talked about this really nicely in that we've probably followed this idea of germ theory to its bitter and despicable end. And I think when I first heard about COVID, I was interested in that. You know, we are sharing the planet. And then when I started to understand that the main risks for doing poorly from that disease were metabolic, um, I became excited about that in many ways because I thought, well, here's finally we're going to get an opportunity to, to do terrain health, to improve the robust, robustness of our species. But we didn't do that, did we? We went down the other way and we followed it to its bitter end. And the bitter end was bitter. And we didn't weigh harms and benefits. And what we saw in the likes of Melbourne, um, now in hindsight, seems barely believable that that was a thing. Uh, and that's happened in mental health as well. And I think around the use and primary use of antidepressants as a frontline tool, it's nearly 20 years ago that a, a psychologist called Irving Kirsch started to do meta-analyses of randomised trials, trying to understand if the effect of that medicine was anything better than placebo, because there is a placebo effect. Uh, and, and that was highly controversial at the time. He was really undermined and, and uh, ostracised from the scientific community for his view that there was hardly any positive effect above placebo. Uh, and it was probably not worth it taking into account the, the probable harms. Um, just to give you a nature of those harms with antidepressants for uh, young people under 24, the US has a black box warning about antidepressants because it may disturb sleep. My, uh, may cause suicidal ideation uh, and other things that are worse than being mentally unwell. And so that's really followed a course over the last 20 years. And I think really this uh, latest meta-analysis says, well, there is some positive effect of antidepressants. The, the average effect above placebo is about a 1.8 point change in the Hamilton depression scale, and that's a 40-point scale. It's, it is a change, and it may be useful for some people, but it's not clinically meaningful. And you compare that with other known interventions and their effectiveness from randomised trials. Something like a sleep intervention will give you, on average, a six-point improvement on the same scale. Uh, you know, diet's going that way as well. Certainly exercise and fitness is medicine, which I think in the low-carb community we need to be careful about pitting against diet. You know, they're separate and important things for our health. Fitness is medicine, food is medicine. It's a little bit like, in my opinion, saying what's more important, your right hand or your left foot? Um, and you might choose your right hand, nutrition, um, but just try going without your left foot. Uh, exercise. Uh, so, you know, that's the thing. Uh, it makes no, little or no difference to quality of uh, life, and really this, I think, capped it off. So this is an umbrella uh, review that came out in Nature Medicine just a couple of months ago, and it does everything from an, a, a meta-analysis of the trials to a meta-analysis of the prospective studies to a, a, a systematic review and analysis of the mechanisms. And they conclude that while uh, antidepressants, SSRIs, do increase serotonin, um, they have little or no effect on, on the outcomes that matter, and they do cause harms. And so the question is, are we pursuing a... a biological theory that is wrong, or is there no biological theory? And I want to explore that today. 
And I suppose the other encouraging thing, although it hasn't turned into any actual action, is the Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists put out this position statement uh, almost a year ago now, and they really identified that the, in mild to moderate disorders and even in, in major depressive disorder, then we should really exa exhaust the lifestyle treatments um, before we go to um, medicines for, for mood disorders. Um, and that's a good idea because it is evidence-based. Um, the trouble is having the infrastructure and the ability to do that, and that's why we've got involved in the health coaching and the mental health coaching part of that, because if you're going to do that, you're going to need a workforce to actually do that. Uh, and um, we still see in fast in and out medicine that antidepressants are the primary um, first line defence. Uh, and interestingly, actually Australia has some really interesting statistics on this. I think you're appalled by them, that about 4% of our under 10 year olds are medicated with SSRIs. That goes to 10% of our teenagers. And every decade you get older in Australia, the, there, is a, there is a higher prescription of antidepressant medicines. And when you get to the 80 plus age group, half of Australians are on antidepressants, which is a really sad thing, but it also doesn't match with what we know about population health and well-being. And we've studied this quite extensively in New Zealand in our own sovereign well-being work, is that from 20 onwards, every decade you get older, your well-being, your happiness, your life satisfaction um, improves right up until when you die. So that's good news as you're getting older. Everyone's getting older, so you've got something to look forward to. There's one caveat to that. When you have children, <laughs> your well-being plummets. <laughs> but the good news about that is when they leave home, <laughs> it goes higher, and it goes higher than the people who never had children and stays higher for the rest of your life. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So let's think about food and mood particularly. I want to talk about diet. We're at low carb down under, so let's do that. Uh, and, and see where we get to. Um, first of all, here's some photos of, we've been doing uh, these food studies in year five and six children. We've just been going to schools and, and getting their lunch and putting it in a box and taking a photo of their school lunch. They take their school lunch together. That's two kids' lunches. Um, we've, we've done several hundred of these. Um, and, and while that is appalling, it's not atypical because about 70% of the contents of our kids' lunch box are what we call ultra-processed. Food, um, and in my observation, what changes by socioeconomic status isn't the quality of the food, it's the rubbish that's on the label, contains vegetables in the chips. And you look it up and it's 2% of God knows what, so, um, but they're still chips. So that's, you know, that's the food environment we're working in. Uh, I, I would say with food and mood, and we've heard it a bit this conference, which is encouraging, but I hardly ever hear much of a discussion um, about simple reactive hypoglycemia. That, that if you wanted to have the most major effect on, on mood and well-being, then that, I think about, my guess is about 50% of our population is in a, runs most of their life in a state of reactive hypoglycemia. You have a, a, a starchy, sugary breakfast, your blood sugar goes up, your insulin goes up, it goes up for longer, it overcompensates, you have a drop in blood sugar, um, now you're hypoglycemic, um, and depending on your state, of mind. Um, you could just be hungry, you could be angry, you could be a combination of both, and we know the word for that. So the, that, you know, that, that's something that I think, if we were thinking about mental health and, and food as a simple solution, and the, the omelette for breakfast, or just flagging it all together, um, you know, may be a good way to go, um, and then you can end up like this. Uh, there's also the idea of addiction, and not everyone gets addicted to food in the same way that I'm not encouraging this, but people could take methamphetamine and not everyone gets addicted. And I'm not suggesting you do that, but the, the, there's, there's certainly strong evidence um, that many of us are susceptible through that dopamine motivation pathway um, that you know, these are addictive substances. Sugar, uh, starch falls into the same category for the same reason. There's also interesting work. Some, Peter Bruckner presented this yesterday. This is Felice Jacker's work with the SMILES study that uh, improvements in diet quality, more of a Mediterranean diet, but still a good quality diet. You get improvements in, uh, in mood. Um, there's certainly issues with these types of trials, and there's issues with any mental health trial because you're not measuring an outcome that's objective. People are self-reporting on their mental health. So if you randomise people to these types of studies, then they need to be 
equivalent intensity interventions, and they should really be food versus food, um, and we're still to do those. So it's, the possibility of the effect here being placebo is still a strong one, because you enter to go into a diet study and you don't end up in the diet arm, you know, then you sort of know where you've gone, right? Uh, so there should always be diet versus diet. Uh, if you don't know this woman, uh, I suggest you do. My friend, colleague, she's also on our Precure faculty, but it's Professor of Psychology at the University of Canterbury and Christchurch, Julia Rutledge, um, is really an absolute rock star in what they call nutritional uh, psychiatry. Actually, I think she wanted to call it psychology because she felt it was giving too much credit to the psychiatrist. But the, um, her work has really been around micro nutrients in the diet, uh, and her work, which is very careful science, very careful randomized trials where she won't give dietary advice, but she will supplement with very high dose micronutrients. And these are maximum tolerable doses uh, and, and quite powerful things, but no adverse events, but, but still concentrating primarily on young people, but her work across uh, trauma and earthquake survivors and flood survivors to the mosque shootings uh, and the survivors there in Christchurch through to uh, more of these careful clinical trials shows quite strong benefits for micronutrient availability, particularly in teenagers. Um, could you improve their diet as well? Um, yeah, that's a good point. And I keep asking Julia why she's not doing that, and we're embarking with a student on doing that now. Um, but her point is that if you want to demonstrate uh, the effects of nutrition in psychology, then you need to do it in a placebo-controlled trial to start with to be taken seriously. So that's her work, and it's certainly worth uh, thinking about, and um, we've heard about the, the role of uh, ketogenic and uh, diets and fasting and, and mood. I think those still need to be uh, get more and of higher quality, uh, but it certainly seems promising that, that ketogenic and diets and fasting are uh, good and plausible ways to improve uh, mental health. What I want to present now is the rabbit hole that I've been down for the last two years. As you say, you're sitting at home uh, with COVID. I wasn't really up for the renovation of the house, so uh, I've been down this glutamate rabbit hole, and I think it's really interesting, and I think it's of interest to the low-carb community. Now, I think it provides a more simple and more plausible explanation across the range of neurological issues that we see. Uh, and so I want to talk about that now and really introduce you to this idea of this thing called glutamate excitotoxicity. And frankly, I'd never heard of it uh, until one of my uh, postgraduate students, Chrissy, who's studying mental health in teenagers, goes, well, you know it's all about glutamate excitotoxicity. I was like, what? Uh, what's that? And then and she's like, well, it's glutamate. It's the you know, most prevalent neurotransmitter in the brain. It you know, makes up almost all of the neurotransmitters we have. Have you not heard of that? I was like, well, yeah, I did a degree in physiology and a you know, master's and PhD in psychology and physiology. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so how embarrassing is that? Uh, so, so I thought, yeah. Uh, and so I've actually written a paper on that. If you, if, on this whole, if you want to read about this more, if you go onto the Precure website, or just go Grant Schofield, glutamate exotic toxicity. That, I think that the graphic design artist, I think that was an inappropriate picture, to be fair, um, since we're talking about mental health. But still, uh, what are we talking about? Well, first of all, I've, I've always been thinking about poor metabolic health around the trilogy and interaction of these things, oxidative stress, inflammation, and glycation, because they all cause one another. So you have high blood sugar, you glycate. A, a, a carbohydrate molecule, glucose molecule will attach itself to proteins in the body. That, in cell, that, that glycation is itself inflammatory. Uh, it, that hot, more inflammatory environment means when you burn that sugar, um, you create a reaction of oxygen species, oxidative stress. Uh, one affects the, the other. Uh, high insulin causes all of those and stress all of those. Um, and we think about these in terms of um, mental health. But I think if you wanted a more parsimonious theory, it would become a four-way thing where this excitotoxicity is added and you get this every which way thing. So, so what is it? What's going on? In neurons. So it's interesting to think about how the brain works. So you know about brain cells, neurons, and you know about that synapse, the synaptic cleft, and the fact that although there's electrical transmission, there's chemical transmission across those uh, clefts. 
Uh, and we hear so much about dopamine in the reward pathway and uh, I presume it's more to do with motivation than reward uh, around serotonin and, uh, and sort of mood uh, and, and other modulatory neurotransmitters. But really the most important two, the most prevalent two, are glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So it causes action potentials, learning, long-term potentiation. Um, it's highly activated when your sympathetic nervous system or your fight or flight is responded. But it's always fine-tuned by GABA. So there's, there's this sort of inhibitory system and excitatory system fine-tuning each other. And that homeostasis between those two neurotransmitters is something that's crucial in my opinion, for our health, for our mental health, for our brain health, for normal functioning. In the same way that insulin and glucose homeostasis are crucial for our overall metabolic health, this homeostasis there is important. Uh, so what happens, there's activation uh, along a neuron, releases glutamate, it goes to the receptors. Uh, if that works, it activates uh, an action potential in the following neuron. Uh, that activation is crucial for learning. We call that long-term potentiation. That's all good. That's how it works. The trouble is, oh, and it, then it gets turned and recycled back into another uh, amino acid called glutamine uh, by, by support cells, astrocytes and glia. Uh, what happens though is you have an over-efflux of glutamate. You might get that through chronic stress. You're chronically activating your sympathetic nervous system, then the receptors can't cope. Um, they're overactivated and uh, they start to dial themselves down to not being overactivated. And then you start to get this calcium channel efflux in the next neuron, which you don't have to know too much about all that, but it gets complicated quickly. But the problem is that, that directly creates mitochondrial damage, uh, reactive oxygen species, um, and eventually neuronal death. Um, on the same time, some of those extra glutamates might just seep out of the synaptic cleft into general space in the brain. Um, and both of these things have um, issues. And if you can go and look this up, and it gets frightfully more complicated than that, and you know, who knows what the hell's going on in, in all of it. But, but, but uh, you know, really, I, I think it comes down to this. Um, that glutamate is toxic in general space in the brain and it's toxic when it overactivates the calcium channels in the next neurons. And that's a problem because those neurons die. Um, and the trouble with those neurons is they have about 12,000 times more glutamate inside them than outside them. And when they die, that gets spilled out. And you get a, a negative feedback loop of excitotoxicity. So when one neuron is damaged and dies, it spills out and then it kills more neurons and they spill out and so forth and so on and so on and so on. And there's a glutamate excitotoxicity theory when you start to look across the literature that's, that's become very strong in virtually every neurological disorder out there. And I just added yesterday because I hadn't looked so much at Huntington's disease and uh, multiple sclerosis. And I spent the last hour at breakfast with Matthew Phillips talking about both of these um, and he agrees. Um, but I really want to just talk about two sides here which are, give you concrete examples about what's going on. One is just basic neurotrauma, uh, mild traumatic brain injury. You somehow bang your head, you're stupidly climbing a ladder. Uh, I don't know, you're riding one of those scooters. Uh, uh, I always thought they could end badly. Uh, and it does sometimes for people. And so you, you, you bang your head, your brain moves inside the head, it, it kills some brain cells and there's some uh, damage there. And so the trouble with that is that those dying neurons will spill glutamate and so you get an exacerbation of symptoms over time. You get a downward spiral of symptoms and further damage over the subsequent weeks from that concussion. Um, and indeed that's what we see uh, with neurotrauma. You could see the same thing with say uh, ischemia. So you've had a stroke um, or a heart attack and you've had a lack of oxygen to the brain uh, and you've had, you know, that's essentially a traumatic event. Uh, we could have the same thing in something like Alzheimer's or uh, dementia, where brain cells might be dying for other reasons, but as they die, um, then you get this efflux of glutamate into the system, and that causes further damage to the brain, and it's ongoing, so it adds fuel to the fire. So that's on one side, the traumatic stuff's fairly obvious. On the other side, um, cr chronic stress is just a chronic activation of the immune s of the nervous system, then glutamate just keeps firing, and you get essentially the same problem. Um, from a different mechanism. And a single traumatic event psychologically could be enough to cause enough 
glutamate to cause some brain cell death that starts that process and um, winds down. So those are, those are plausible mechanisms. But once you start to look across the literature, this is interesting. So there's a whole bunch of treatments that seem to work uh, for mental health and well-being across all of these neuro, uh, neurological issues. Um, one's cold, uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, there's, there's, there's good trials now about anxiety, and if people have done their cold water immersion, um, they might find that highly effective. Um, and one plausible mechanism that, that, that exposure to cold um, helps you remove glutamate much more easily. And in fact, in the North Shore Hospital in the North Shore where I live, uh, if you have ischemia from a heart attack or um, neonatal hypoxia, they'll actually induce hypothermia, um, and they'll also infuse you with intravenous magnesium, um, and that seems to be beneficial. Um, and the reason for that, I think, is because it reduces glutamate. And what role does magnesium have to play? We'll come back to this in a bit. It's, a, it's an NMDA receptor antagonist. It helps the glutamate receptor be more responsive and remove glutamate more quickly. Uh, there's, uh, there's other interesting things. For example, for women, you, you remove glutamate much more efficiently when estrogen is high. So you can predict mood changes with menstrual cycle, and it's highly commensurate with that. So things like brain fog, um, I shouldn't get too involved in this because it's, it's obviously it's never happened to me. Um, and yeah, anything I say here will probably be wrong. But you know, things like mood and, and, uh, and changes in mood across a menstrual cycle um, uh, are commensurate with estrogen changes. And when you start to measure them, glutamate changes. The same is true around um, neurological symptoms around men perimenopause and menopause as estrogen starts to drop and you can remove them, uh, brain fog and these sorts of things. Uh, breathe, breathing, especially nose breathing, which uh, activates the parasympathetic system as a highly effective strategy. Um, obesity and leptin, we won't get into that too much now. Um, sleep, because it's so anti-inflammatory in the brain, especially that non-REM sleep and the use of the glymphatic system and that activation, uh, it's really an interesting thing. Uh, and I think we know that sleep is so important for for immune, for glutamate removal. Um, exercise, fitness is medicine. Glutamate can be burned directly as a fuel uh, in the mitochondria when you're exercising, which is a good thing. Um, it also reduces inflammation, oxidative stress, um, and glutamate, so there's a good thing. Um, glucose, insulin, and ketones, I'll get to those in more detail in the rest of this talk. Uh, there's an interesting thing. If, if um, your brain is inflamed, you can't remove glutamate so well. If you can bring down inflammation, then you can remove glutamate. And I think that's the primary effect of inflammation um, around neurological health is your ability to remove this glutamate. Um, and then you, therefore you'd expect that a treatment with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories would have a good effect around neurological conditions, say depression. And so you look that up and go, yes, well, there's randomized trials on this. People have done meta-analysis of trial, and there is an effect of of, anti, of an antidepressant effect of non steroidal anti-inflammatories. It's obviously not sustainable. We can't keep taking them. They'll cause other issues. Nevertheless, there's an effect, um, and the effect is better than antidepressants. So um, that's interesting. Um, anything that's anti-inflammatory uh, and an antioxidant um, has an effect there, and there's some of those things. Um, this is interesting, isn't it? This, anything that antagonizes this receptor is important, and if you haven't heard of it, uh, ketamine uh, and analgesic has been really interesting. Uh, it is an antagonist of this NMDA receptor, um, has profound effects on otherwise intractable major depressive disorder. The, yeah, they are temporary, but they're almost instant. Uh, they could last for a few weeks. Uh, and things like chronic pain, uh, five days of, of sub-clinically, you know, so, sub-obvious, you're not drowsy, ketamine things will, will resolve permanently about 50% of otherwise intractable chronic pain. So there's really interesting things there around that antagonist stuff. Some of the hallucinogens, including psilocybin, they have other neurological effects, but one of their primary effects is acting as an antagonist of the same receptor. So there's interesting things going there. Alcohol is an interesting one. So alcohol actually raises GABA. So if you want to know what it feels like to have higher GABA, you drink, you feel calm, you're chilled. That's all. You'd think that would be good, and I think it is temporarily. Um, unfortunately, it impairs sleep quality and quantity and especially destroys um, your ability to uninflame your brain. So I think it, the net effect of alcohol on glutamate is probably bad. Uh, ketamine we've talked about. Uh, creatine randomly has an effect as well. I have no idea why. Uh, let's, let's just finish by talking about the, what we're most interested in here, is, which is uh, fasting. 
So fasting uh, returns everything to baseline and, and glutamate much more quickly, and there's quite good evidence on that. I think you know one of the main mental health and focus clarity benefits is its ability to dial down glutamate and return us to normal GABA glutamate homeostasis. Uh, ketones directly remove glutamate. They're part of that mechanism. Hard to do it without them. Um, it's another reason exercise helps because it produces more uh, ketones, particularly that zone two exercise that I'm a fan, fan of. Not saying you shouldn't do high intensity as well, but um, I think both are important. Uh, glucose, glucose because of its indirect effects about being pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidative and pro-glycative in the brain, um, make it harder to get rid of glutamate. Uh, and let's just talk about insulin more now. I think this is frightfully interesting. Um, it's something I'm just getting to grips with myself. So this really changes the way you think about insulin because we're primed to think about insulin primarily as a glucose disposal hormone. And indeed, that's a really important part of it. It activates these GLUT2 and 4 receptors. You uh, take up glucose into your cells uh, and you remove them. And we've often thought about insulin as not being important in the brain because the, the glial cells, the astrocytes and the neurons are uh, uh, glucose, uh, insulin independent. The GLUT1 and 3 receptors don't need insulin to get them into the brain. So, you know, this is, you've been fasting for a long time, you have a sugary drink, it's disposed of that glucose with no insulin because it goes straight to the brain. And, and that's just been an interesting thing. That's, that's how the body prioritises glucose as a priority fuel um, when it turns up. It's an important organ, you want to shove your first bit of fuel there, and it does it through that mechanism. Yet, something interesting is happening because every single neurological cell has an insulin receptor. So what, what for if it's not glucose disposal? Well, uh, it turns out to be hugely important in satiation, uh, in neuroplasticity, and learning. So without that, you can't learn. So, so the whole of our neuroplasticity, which is well-being, uh, depends uh, on insulin. But something really interesting ha happens when you're hyperinsulinemic, it's the exact opposite of what you would think about. So you've got high insulin in your serum, in your body, and that insulin can cross the blood-brain barrier. But it needs to be transported across. It's a big peptide as insulin transporters. The thing is that those insulin transporters are very, very easily saturated and stop their normal function. So the paradox here, here's the, if this is the most important part of this talk, I think, that when you're hyperinsulinemic, you have low insulin in your brain. Oh, so, wow, what's going on there? Why and how and why is that important? So you now have less neuroplasticity, less ability to run your normal neurological processes because you have low insulin, not high insulin. And insulin is crucial in the removal of glutamate and that homeostasis is drastically impaired. And you can see this, I've always wondered, you know, someone's got Alzheimer's disease, they're suffering from hyperinsulinemia, yet nasal insulin spray is, is briefly effective in resolving symptoms because this is a way of delivering insulin directly from the brain because you're actually in a low insulin state uh, in the brain. So insulin in normal quantities, and the brain does actually produce some small amounts of insulin itself, but that pales in, in comparison to what's the pancreatic stuff that can and get across that blood brain barrier. So insulin's important, but for a very different reason in the brain, we need more of it, not less of it, but conversely, having hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance being on the standard American diet means you don't have enough insulin in the brain. Isn't that a kicker? That's an, I think that's frightfully interesting. And lastly, I just wanted to finish with the idea of dietary glutamate. You can eat this stuff. And what does it do? Well, nothing, I thought, because actually glutamate, you think MSG, shouldn't cross the blood-brain barrier. It's not capable of doing that. Yet it does somehow, because while there's leaky gut, there's also leaky brain. And so if you've got a leaky gut, sort of permeability there, then it's likely that other substances, unfortunately not insulin, will travel across that leakiness. And one of those things is glutamate in food. Um, and I've interviewed this woman, this is Kathleen Houghton, um, who's a nutritional psychologist in uh, Washington in the US. Um, and her idea of the low glutamate diet, which is really interesting, she doesn't come from a low carb or a keto background, but you know, avoiding some of these things is important. And when you start to look at her, uh, her lists of foods to uh, avoid, 
Um, even the, the plant guys from yesterday will be loving this stuff because it's like, you know, avoid, you know, basically all of these things. Uh, uh, yeah, quite a lot actually. So you come down to a fairly pared down type uh, low carb keto whole food diet with a, an emphasis only on some uh, vegetables. Uh, things like artificial sweeteners, you notice there, they have nothing to do with being glutamate, but they increase the permeability of the blood brain, the blood brain barrier and, and therefore leaky brain, which may be another issue for those things. Um, and she sees some quite um, good effects, at least in this case, in chronic pain. More work needs to be done, but there is a low um, glutamate diet, and that may resolve some issues for some people, and I think lines up pretty much with what we've been doing in this community for the last decade or so. Uh, so to summarise, I suppose, um, you know, really a fan of this hormetic medicine, which you see all of those things I've talked about are things that help us return and become a to normal homeostasis. It helps us as a robustness, as a specimen, uh, and the species, frankly, can do with being more robust. Uh, I think that diagram is self-explanatory. We need to avoid that. Uh, and, you know, what can we do? And I think this... I'll be involved, we've got an election coming up in uh, New Zealand, and uh, you've just had one, but suppose when I want to think about public policy to uh, improve our lot, whether that be metabolic health uh, or a, a, a subset of that, which we might think of as um, mental health or brain health or neurological health, and I think we need to start to, as a society, invest heavily in these three pillars. Um, prevention is cure, uh, is a complete no-brainer, excuse the pun. The reality is that we, we hardly invest in that. And when we do, we call things that aren't prevention, prevention, so bowel cancer and breast cancer screening might be important. I'm no real expert in that. Um, they're not prevention, they're detecting disease. They're not prevention. Um, real prevention... Uh, is something we need to change and embrace as a society. Our workforce development is, we, we can't keep going with this current system, uh, and that's why I've gotten so involved in the health coaching and the mental health coaching and the interest in health coaching. Um, and you don't need to go to university and learn to be a psychologist for um, nine years. I did that, and I still didn't know what, dope, uh, what glutamate was. So, you know, <laughs> you know, I might have missed the days they were talking about how to actually do anything useful. Uh, which is plausible, but I didn't actually learn that much, and I think you can do that and get that work um, much more quickly and much more effectively um, you know, outside of the university sector. I'm still employed by the university, um, but I think tertiary education um, has to and must change. Um, you know, I mean, our complete ineptitude across the last three years, if, if it's not obvious that we're completely broken, what is? Uh, and lastly, for both our... You know, <laughs> Thank you. I think, think, I think we can all agree on that. Um, and lastly, uh, 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 yeah, if you're a member of society, you probably, I mean, you could, and I've just been in Hawaii, which was great, and it was all hedonistic and great fun, but, but it's no life to live um, in that. Life is about meaning and purpose, and for most of us, that meaning is going to be derived about leaving the world in a better place. Um, and part of that is, as a member of society is to provide care to people who need it, and it's the sort of care that works. And I think especially in mental health, that seems particularly perverse. Um, in New Zealand, we have the highest youth suicide rate in the world. Um, and I, I mean, we're a formerly wealthy country now, not a natural wealthy country. Um, Australia is still a wealthy country, is that true? <laughs> sort of. Uh, but you know, where else would you allocate your resources but to, to act with humanity in those persons and send the police around on your own son or something? I mean, it just seems wrong at every level we can do better. So thank you very much and um, look forward to some questions.